What do you guys think is the oldest trick in the book when it comes to hacking? Maybe it's logging onto somebody's router or server with the default admin credentials. Maybe it's a fake antivirus program that actually installs real viruses after doing a fake scan. Well, besides social engineering, of course, one of the oldest tricks in the hacker's book is the executable file made to look like a non-executable file. It usually shows up as a .jpg.exe or a .mp3.exe, and it actually tricked a lot of people back in the days of Windows XP and prior. But even today, in the dark ages of Windows 11, people are still falling for this. Last week, a torrent was making its way across the internet called Spider-Man Net Pudidomoy.torrent.exe. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, I'm probably not, but when translated from Russian to English, it is Spider-Man No Way Home .torrent.exe. So obviously, this torrent is claiming to be a pirated copy of the Spider-Man movie that just came out about two weeks ago. And in case you didn't know, a good way to find new release torrents like this is to search for them in Russian, since torrenting is as much a part of Russian culture as squats and vodka. Now, I can understand downloading the wrong Spider-Man movie, because back when I was a young lad, I tried to download Spider-Man 3 from LimeWire and instead got hardcore German porn. But at least I actually got a video file, and at age 13, it honestly wasn't that bad of a file to get. But even at that age, I knew the basics of file types. I knew that if you try to add multiple file extensions to a file, that it's just going to take on the properties of whatever the last file extension is. Now, I know that that's an oversimplified explanation of file types. There's a little bit more to it than that. But that was my understanding at age 13. I knew that if a file was a .avi.exe or a .mp3.bat, don't click that shit or else somebody is going to hack my precious RuneScape account. So let's take a look at what this Spider-Man virus is and what it does. So the source code of the virus is Base64 encoded. This isn't anything too crazy. In fact, it's actually a pretty common thing that we see in malware because it helps to avoid detection with some antivirus programs. The file information also makes the malware look legitimate to a novice that might try to look into its properties. It claims to be published by Google. It claims in the file description that it is chrome.exe. And eventually what this program does is it injects itself into svchost.exe, which is an essential program in the Windows operating system that serves as a shell for loading services from DLL files. This is the snippet of code that actually does the injection, which we can read after it's been decrypted. And by the way, all of these code screenshots are provided by Reason Labs. They have a blog entry about this virus, which I'll link in the description for those of you that want to read about it. But this is the actual injection function here that takes resources from a file called rvyzh, which is compressed in a zip file. Now, that's another common tactic to have a malicious payload that is compressed or encrypted in some way that gets loaded from a separate function. That way, your antivirus program can't really accurately analyze the malicious payload. And I really want to nail home a point here that just because you use antivirus or you have Windows Defender updated, that doesn't mean anything for hackers that have just an ounce of skill. So far, all of the obfuscation that this malware is doing from encoding its functions to loading the payload from a separate compressed zip file, that's all really basic stuff that you could learn how to do after spending maybe 10 minutes on a hacker forum. Hell, there's even modules in Metasploit that do this stuff for you. Like if you go and install Kali Linux like any other script kitty, you literally have the tools right at your hand to generate malware with this kind of obfuscation. And oftentimes this really basic stuff is good enough to bypass the majority of antivirus programs out there. 
Now, what does this malware actually do after it binds itself to svchost.exe? Because usually that's just a tactic to make sure that it doesn't get closed out by a separate program or by the user. Well, it adds some exception rules to Windows Defender to further make sure that it doesn't get killed by a program, sometimes going so far as to whitelist all files that are ending with .exe or .dll in Windows Defender, which really opens up your system for a compromise if more malware ends up getting executed, because obviously it's going to be some kind of an executable file. It then edits your registry to add some persistence. So even if you reboot your computer, this malware is going to execute again. And then for the finale, it installs a crypto miner, but not just any crypto miner, the silent XMR miner, which as you can tell by the name is a Monero miner, but it actually has the ability to mine several other cryptocurrencies as well, including Wownero and Ravencoin. And the silent part of the silent XMR miner comes from the fact that it's actually pretty difficult to detect on your system if somebody else has loaded this. We could take a look at the main features here. So uh, injection, silent, hidden. You can hide the payload behind another process like Explorer ESE, uh, conhost EXE, or SVC host.exe, which is the one that was used in this case. Uh, I can do both CPU and GPU mining. That all depends on whatever algorithms are being used by whichever coin you want to mine. Idle mining can be configured to mine at different usages or not at all while the computer is or isn't in use. So it can try to detect, is this computer idling? And if it is idling, that probably means that the person isn't at it right then and there. So then you can go crazy and mine a whole bunch of coins. Stealth pauses the miner and clears the GPU memory while any of the programs in the stealth targets option are opened. So you can obviously remotely administer uh, this, um, th this miner. It tells you that right here in the remote configuration. Uh, but you can set it up so that if somebody opens up a game and let's say you're mining, I think Ravencoin, you would mine with a GPU if I remember correctly. You could set it up so that when somebody opens a game, oh, just close out that miner. Or maybe if it's a game that doesn't really utilize your CPU, like apparently a lot of games in current years still can't even make use of all four cores of a CPU, you could set it up so that it uses maybe half of your CPU. And then the end user won't even notice. They'll be able to game on their system and not even tell that it's mining in the background or if they just have a potato computer, you cut off the miner, wait for them to go to bed or you know pass out from a late night gaming session and then boom, you're back to mining. Uh, Watchdog replaces the miner file if it's removed and starts if uh, the injected miner is closed down. So even if you try to kill this or if you're maybe cleaning up your file system and you notice some weird configuration file, you delete it, that watchdog is gonna put it right back. Bypass Windows Defender adds exclusions into Windows Defender for the general folders and minor uses. So again, you don't have to be a hacker to use this or to put it on somebody's machine. If you can pretty much just get them to execute it, which is more social engineering than anything, then you're good to go. And if you manage to get this on enough powerful systems and configure it in such a way that it doesn't interrupt the computer owner's day-to-day -day usage, it could be months or even years before they ever notice. Imagine how much money you could make from this being deployed to a thousand or even a hundred gaming computers. And if you're mining Monero, then even the feds are gonna have a hard time tracking you down. Now I know that that's a pretty chaotic neutral or worse take that I have on this, but I am not advocating that you use this for hacking and neither is the creator of this software. So how can you prevent a hack like this happening to you? Just check your file types, dude. Just check what you're downloading and double check before you click on it. I mean, seriously, if you're still falling for this trick in current year, it's time for you to seriously consider becoming Amish. I mean, if you're okay at growing crops, maybe a little bit of carpentry and you can grow a beard, you should really consider it because computer literacy 
It is not an optional thing in current year. In fact, it hasn't been optional for several decades at this point. The days where computer knowledge was just for geeky nerds, that's long gone. Computers dominate every single industry. And not knowing how to use one, it's like not knowing how to ride a horse or fire a gun if you live in the Old West. How do you think you're going to survive? So learn to computer. Otherwise, it's just a matter of time until some Russian kid is mining Monero with your spare gaming rig.